Hello. We're here for a conversation, a conversation about lack of access and is it discriminatory? I'm Lydia Neville and I'm here with Julie Phillips. I wish to begin by acknowledging the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional owners of the land on which I am today. I pay my respects to the local people for allowing me and my family to live and gather on their land and to their elders past, present and future. Julie, I'd like to introduce you to the Aussie Way community. We, Aussie Way people, are here working on making the world more inclusive by making web resources, digital resources, accessible to everyone. You're here, Julie, especially because you're the manager of the Victorian Disability Discrimination Legal Service, DDLS. DDLS provides legal support for people who've suffered discrimination. This is at the opposite end from where most of us work creating the discriminatory resources. Well, actually making resources that are not discriminatory, we hope. Thanks, Liddy. Um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, uh, the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. This session, Julie, really is about what happens when something for which we're responsible discriminates against a person with disability and what can be done. We could probably consider a case where lots of people are discriminated against or not included, but let's focus on what happens for an individual who cannot achieve their goals and comes to the DDLS or a private lawyer or an equivalent service. We could start with an example. A famous explorer has died recently and members of the Explorer Club want to honor her. They put together some photos, a spreadsheet showing her expeditions, a movie of hers about the dangers of being in a region which is now closed to mountain climbers, and a video interview in Mongolian with a terrorist. Susan's a lecturer at the University of Sport and Adventure, and she's putting together a lecture about expeditions and politics for her students. She's blind. She cannot see the photos. Despite being good at manipulating spreadsheets, she cannot manage this one published as a PDF. She can listen to the movie, but the locations being described are indicated by images of road signs that she can't see. So she doesn't know what's where and she cannot understand Mongolian. So like a translation of the interview. Susan is sick of battling with things she cannot access and calls the DDLS. So what we would do is find out the facts of the matter and um, compare what's occurred with the restricted um, uh, parts of the discrimination legislation, either state or federal. And I say restrictive because um, discrimination law is very rigid and therefore when things happen to people that might not uh, see, be seen to be fair, um, they're not always discriminatory. And in that way, uh, we would be referring them to perhaps another complaint system, uh, a statutory authority, um, a different kind of legal service, an advocacy service. So the first thing our lawyers would do um, would be to look at the merits of the case and the facts of the case and see if what had uh, what has occurred could be a breach of either a state or federal discrimination legislation. Okay, so what about what she has to do? Does Susan's team have to establish she's a case? Can't she just sue because she can't access the resources? Is there such an action as you haven't given me what the standards say I need so you have to pay me, for example? Well, sometimes um, it's often not as simple as that, though. I mean, there are different sorts of standards, um, some attached to laws, um, some uh, attached to local council. Um, again, it really depends on what sort of action um, is available to her, which is a matter for lawyers to take. Um, we do have a Charter of Human Rights uh, here in Victoria, but it has its own restrictions. For example, you can't use it on its own. You, you have to be using some other sort of law. Um, um, and, and see if you can use those two laws together. So it really is important for that initial appointment to get all the facts together to see uh, what, um, what sort of action is available to a person. So if the legal team, DDLS, and, and she decide to do something, what, what laws come into play? 
Well, we've got the Equal Opportunity Act in Victoria. So each um, state in Australia has its own um, local uh, discrimination laws or anti-discrimination laws. And we also have the Disability Discrimination Act, which is um, a piece of legislation which covers the whole of Victoria, uh, sorry, Australia. So there's, um, there's different reasons why you might take one over the other and a lawyer would help you decide that. Sometimes it's, uh, you, you might want to take into account um, money and the fact that one might cost a lot to use and put you at risk of costs and one might be for free. Um, one might have um, a superior legislation in terms of the particular point that, that your, um, your example relates to. So, uh, and you can also, once you've decided that, you might be able to use the Charter of Human Rights with that. So it's something that you decide upon with your lawyer. And, and it's all about discrimination. What's discrimination? So discrimination is basically, uh, it falls under two headings. One's direct discrimination and one is indirect discrimination. And, and to make it really simple, which it isn't, um, Direct discrimination is treating someone um, unfavorably or less favorably because of their disability. So you might be treating them differently. You might not employ someone because they have a disability. Um, you might um, not allow someone to attend something because they have a disability. Um, so uh, that's direct discrimination. And indirect discrimination could be um, something such as uh, treating people all the same. Um, in other words, not doing something special for a person with a disability when that's exactly what needs to be done. Um, so uh, you may, for example, say that everybody has to um, prove their knowledge of a university subject by um, uh, recording their knowledge in front of the class on video and speaking to that knowledge. So a deaf person may not be able to do that because they can't speak and they need instead um, to do it through Auslan. So, so again, it's when you impose uh, something on everybody that disadvantages the person with a disability. Lastly, we have um, the provision of reasonable adjustments or lack thereof. And look, depending on, on which law you use, that, that falls under a different area. But basically it's to do with the non-provision of reasonable adjustments for that person or supports, to put it simply. Okay, so if you deliberately make something so that I in particular can't have something as I need it and you don't make reasonable adaptations, I'm discriminated against, that's according to both state and federal law. And if you make something that's not good, it's good for everyone, but I suffer discrimination because I can't get what I need, I'm discriminated against. Do you have to make it work for me, make accommodations and adjustments? Well, look, the simple answer is yes, but unfortunately, there are a lot of exceptions. Um, so, for example, um, if you're a small organisation or a neighbourhood house, for example, that runs on um, no money or, or just a bit of a council handout, and you are expected to do something for somebody with a disability, which costs more than you will ever um, have, then, for example, you'll you'll have a defence, which is basically that you can't afford it. Um, and that defence needs to be tested, obviously, because um, there are people that might say they can't afford it when they can. But so the short answer is yes, but because of all of the exemptions and defences, um, that's why you need a lawyer. It's not as easy as it sounds. So in the digital sphere, uh, we don't have specifications and standards that cover everything, but we do have quite a few of them. But, but they're sort of about avoiding discrimination, and that's what the Human Rights Commission has said. They made it clear that following the standards is the best way to ensure against discrimination, but it doesn't mean you're not being discriminatory. Yeah, and it depends which standards um, that you're talking about. We have a problem uh, in Victoria in that the um, the transport standards haven't been followed and there doesn't seem to be much concern about that. Um, then on the other hand, we have the disability standards for education, which are so broad as to be meaningless and therefore it doesn't really matter if they're followed or not. They're actually not producing any any outcomes for students with disabilities. 
Um, so in theory, while that's nice to say um, that the stand, you know, following the standards would fix everything, um, that's just not the case. And, and the other kind of interesting thing is that if you do follow the standards and to achieve the standards, you might actually do it one way or another way. And you manage to make things that are um, <laughs> satisfy the standards. You're not going to necessarily make the playing field easy for people. The digital gap, digital gap initiative points out that you might have accessible solutions to the digital payment problem, but you might have lots of different solutions and so somebody trying to use one of these things might actually be able to use it but not know that it works this way this time and that work the way the next time and so that in itself almost makes it inaccessible so yeah yeah and yeah. different people with disabilities have different um, issues accessing the same thing and so when people are designing um, whether it's equipment or software um, they have to be cognizant of all types of people with disabilities because they might just focus on one section of the, the disability community and and come up with a really good solution for them but inadvertently ignore another and it's not accessible to that group so um, it just goes to show the importance of consultation and and in the digital world that consultation is sort of we do our design and then we put something up there and we very rarely have an actual conversation with the person for whom we've produced the resources and and couldn't in Susan's case could the, the explorer club say well you know they're not discriminating they're just putting up stuff that would be nice to share with their members yeah and they they might say that um, but discrimination law covers a whole lot of areas of public life I guess and um, uh, if it's if it's a club that's open to the public uh, you know, sporting venues, clubs, pubs, um, schools, employment, you know, whether it's recreation or something far more serious, they're, they're mostly covered by um, legislation and, and discrimination legislation. So if one part of the community can access it, why shouldn't, in theory, the rest of the community or the, the whole community access it? Um, that's meant to be the theory behind it. Um, but then again, you've got some exemptions, which I talk about before. And so if the neighbourhood house um, has uh, 10 steps and then someone tells them, well, they've got to put in um, a mini lift, which is uh, far more than they will ever um, receive in funding over a 10 year period that will be a defence and a reason why they don't have to do it. It's not so much because the um, what, what's going on in that community house might be trivial. It might be a macrame making course, I don't know. But um, it's more about, um, you know, is, the, is there an exemption that applies to them because of their size, for example, which means that even if they've got all the good intentions in the world, um, it's just not possible for them to create access for everybody. And, and I guess the other side of that is the the um, person who's feeling discriminated against, their position is this may be essential to them, to what they do. Um, it may be that it's just macrame, but it may be that they're actually the world something or other uh, champion and they need to know how to do this macrame to complete their job or do something. Would it make a difference, for example, if Susan was in fact employed by the Explorers Club to provide lectures for the university? And she actually would argue that she couldn't do a job properly because if she if she does the lectures with what she can get access to, it's going to be inadequate. She won't be doing very good lectures. Um, so they need to make all of that accessible. And if they she asks them to make it all accessible in the end they turn around and say to her well you can't do the job we'll get someone else so is it yeah is it and, that, and that brings it? in um yeah that brings in for example then employment discrimination uh, which is a bit different from the scenario before where you know she might have just been accessing something that the club was providing as an end user um so uh Again, though, unjustifiable hardship or the, the ability to afford some, uh, some adjustment will come into it. But if you're going to ask someone to do a job and the job's not accessible to them, that's a big problem. On the other hand, um, not employing her because she's got a disability and they don't want to make um, 
the adjustments for her well and that's just a different sort of discrimination so again you know you'd have to look at all the um all the facts and circumstances around what was happening um and and that's why you need a lawyer too because it's not easy by any means and and we have this interesting problem i was referring then to an iso standard 20016 which is about um, assessing how important a particular thing is to an individual and making sure that you don't um, discriminate against them when there's something that's important, rated as important, for example, to do with the law or their education or their health, um, compared with something that's purely for fun. Um, and, and that becomes a national standard that's been adopted, I think, as an Australian standard, but because it's a standard means nothing in the law. It's just a sort of an indicative thing. Yeah, and if you look at, um, you know, if you put value judgments on different types of activities, um, look at watching TV, um, for example, and um, it's one thing to um, be expecting uh, subtitles for um, neighbours, you know, the show, show Neighbours, you know, <laughs> there's some people who might say, well, we've got as much right to watch an episode of Neighbours as the rest, um, the rest of the community. Um, and then you've got um, more serious things that happen on TV, such as the um, announcements for the bushfires, the announcements for coronavirus, that sort of thing, which is more life and death. It's all about accessing television um, and whatever the value judgment is, you've got, um, unless you, for example, put subtitles or have Auslan interpreters, you've got a whole section of the community that's not being able to access it. Yeah, so it's, oh, gosh, it's so complicated. Well, if in fact the DDLS was able to help Susan, what, what could she expect? How long does it take to get some results and what sort of results do you get when you so-called win a case or what happens? Well, unfortunately, it can take between two and three years sometimes if you go all the way through to a hearing or a trial. Um, and so often, depending on what your issue is, it's too late. Um, and, and while you might start off wanting change, in the end, because the, uh, the actual change you wanted is no longer available for you, then you might just be looking at, um, at compensation. Um, but the other thing is you might want systemic reform, and that's why you might pursue um, a win in the court. Um, and often for large um, respondents who it may not be in their best interests to have decisions by courts. They may try and uh, pay off the, the person who's complained and give them a really good settlement so they don't actually have to make the systemic changes um, because it's cheaper that way. Um, so court, courts and tribunals, those processes don't always end up the way you might like them to either. Uh, so that's been an issue for us in the digital space that we know that there have been lots of times when people have complained, but there are not a lot of law precedents that we can point to. There's settlements and there's very often a confidentiality agreement in that as part of the settlement so that they're not allowed to talk about how much money they were paid to be quiet or, or to go away or whatever it was. So, yeah, that's a serious problem, isn't it? And it's really the, the reverse of what the law says it's setting out to achieve. Um, and I know that the DDLS, with the experience over the years now, we've managed to get um, some very good reviews and, and advocacy written up um, in the DDLS. Recently, I think you contributed a review uh, to the review of the Disability Standards for Education and made some very good suggestions about how that could be improved. And once we improve it for education, we can start to improve it more broadly, I think. Would you tell us about those ideas? Yeah, so we looked at the Disability Standards for Education, which um, are uh, a set of guidelines which are meant to make your obligations under the Disability Discrimination Act in regard to education more clear. Um, the problem is that they don't and they're inconsistent, they're contradictory um, to the actual um, act itself and they're so broad that they allow um, too much interpretation which is never good um, because you know when you challenge a uh, uh, something that's happened to be discriminatory, what you end up with is lawyers arguing about it. And therefore, um, 
uh, the intent perhaps of the law sometimes goes out the window and the concrete nature of what has been written is relied upon. So if you've got things that are vague and broad, it doesn't help anybody. So um, the standards themselves, um, we found that they actually took away from the Disability Discrimination Act and, and it would be better if they didn't exist. That's how um, poorly they've been written. Um, and so our our recommendation was that they are scrapped and somebody starts again. Okay, so really what you're saying is it's not a help to have everything wide open and, and guess it. We've said earlier that every situation is going to be different, so you're going to have to actually look carefully at that. And I think the way that, that you're proposing to get around that is to prescribe not the solution, but to prescribe the consultations, the assessments, the the steps that lead to a fair outcome. Is that is that clear? Um, yeah, look, we, we think that the way that the um, uh, Individuals with Disabilities uh, in Education Act in America is a far superior um, way of going about um, education and and what that law does is set out very specifically what needs to happen and when and who needs to be involved and what it does is that it minimizes the wriggle room um, for lawyers and um, departments of education to be able to squirm out of their responsibilities by arguing about you know words that are vague or broad um, because it's too uh, prescriptive and um, uh, when I say two, I mean that in a good way. Um, it, it sets out everything uh, without um, ambiguity. And, uh, and that's what we need because currently, you know, one of the things you've got to do is test your laws and your standards. And you've got to learn um, from mistakes. And therefore, um, if after five years or even three years of standards or laws you look and you and you look at the outcomes and you say you're not achieving the outcomes you you've got to reform what you've done and and that's why law reform and the reform of any sort of standard is so important um, and we're very slow on law reform here um, and we're not we're not having a look at how things are playing out in the courts and seeing if that the the uh, what is occurring or those outcomes are um, are following the intent of the legislation. In other words, Parliament um, set out objectives to these discrimination acts. Are these objectives being reached through the laws? Are the laws and the standards an adequate vehicle for um, reaching those objectives? If they're not, you've got to quickly move on and, and change things. And that's what we are advocating for. And, and I think we've had a, I mean, certainly in the digital context we've had a problem that originally everybody was described by some kind of medical disability and what's really relevant is their ability and what what they can and can't do and what they need not what the name of their medical condition might happen to be um, but the problem comes about when you talk about adjustments being made I think that the law in some cases has got very academic and carried on about um, what is an adjustment and is the adjustment being made because of the person's disability or because of this that or other? could you explain what's what the problem is there yeah there have been a few um, what I call attacks and and um, uh, unfortunate interpretations in relation to reasonable adjustments which you know with the best of intentions came into um, Australian discrimination law, um, state and federal, um, about 10 years ago. And uh, in terms of the federal law, the problem is that there's um, it, it, that section um, was really put put in the wrong place, if I can be that basic. And so um, the the most recent um, interpretation, which is probably technically correct in about 2017, was that you now as a person with a disability have to prove that not only did someone um, not provide you with uh, a reasonable adjustment, but the reason that they didn't provide it was because you had a disability. Um, and when you think about it, that, that doesn't make sense. It's obviously an error, um, but that's, that's the way um, that it is at the moment with the current law. So that's one problem. But the other problem is that the term adjustment has been um, 
interpreted very narrowly and rigidly uh, and uh, particularly in education cases where the Victorian Department of Education and Training has argued very vigorously against um, uh, allowing that term to be seen to be broad and they've been successful in those arguments. So for example, um, their position, uh, they argued a position successfully that um, an assessment could not be an adjustment. And uh, for people with disabilities with complex needs, for example, one of the first things they need might be an assessment to determine what happens next for them, what supports they need. And so the assessment is um, as important, if not most important, because it must come first as the support that they get later on. So by arguing that an assessment is an adjustment and it's not needed, you can be in a no man's land for years because you haven't had the assessment that determines the support. Um, so these are the sorts of narrow, rigid interpretations, again, that don't sit well with the objectives of the law, but are nevertheless part of the law now and, um, and don't help um, people with disabilities. And therefore, um, given the way people or lawyers argue about the law and and it is it does become a, a legal ping pong game that's why we believe that the best answer to that is to make laws as prescriptive as possible and and we need to broaden in our opinion we need to broaden the meaning of the term adjustment so that um, it doesn't actually get in the way of uh, supports for people with disabilities which is what it's doing at the moment so so i see the equivalent in the digital space, I mean, what happens in the classroom is, is that there is a negotiation to a certain extent, perhaps with the building, you can't put up a, a ramp immediately. In the, in the digital space, you provide what you think are going to be inclusive or accessible resources, you find out that they're not. Um, well, how do you find out? And this is the problem that we haven't actually been focusing on. How do you find out what this particular person actually needs? And that's a move that's being um, undertaken very much in the standards field now to try and find a way of allowing the user of a digital resource to say what they need to do that assessment online or in advance or some way, um, the, the sort of assessment you're talking about, to do an assessment and say, these are my requirements. And then they can um, at least have a service that will match resources to their requirements. So I think it's very closely a, 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 an analogous situation. I think looking at these problems and thinking about the reforms that would work in both ways and having examples of the digital space and the real world space and constructed spaces, all these different spaces where we operate would be very helpful. I think um, Aussie Way has a number of people who could contribute to that. And I think that it would be a very interesting conversation to have to look at these um, resources that you've put together, which are extremely good about um, based on the research about the needs for reform. So um, I, I hope that we can do some of that together. I think you you said the the approach in America is good in this one. That's something when there is a, um, a precedent, something we can look at that makes a huge uh, advantage for us. And it's a, a bit of a shift in thinking. So I think that'd be really interesting if we could do it. Um, the um, idea of, of thinking about reform, thinking about advocacy. Some of these things are things that Aussie Way as an organisation hasn't done up until now. We've been very much a, having a conference once a year organisation, but we're knowing that other people are doing that very well now. We're stepping a little bit more into the support of the professional um, accessibility person. And I think these are areas where we will see growth from Aussie Way. So Julie, thank you very much for your contributions. Very interesting. There's always a lot to learn. There's lots more to learn we know. If we could bottle you and keep you going. Thank you very much for your contribution today. Thanks, Liddy. That's good. Hope to see you again soon. Bye. Bye.